it started as a routine excavation, but what was discovered was far from routine. It was found on site by one of the workers. We thought it might mean something. Yes, it does. It's a warning. Analysis of the text reveals some form of cult worship, where local populations were hypnotized and drawn trance-like to a specific site. The site was almost certainly the home of a life form. An alien life form. And what would happen when the creature appeared? It would feed. In 1990, Alton Towers decides that it wants to open a big new roller coaster for 1994. Now, you probably don't understand the problems that we have here at Alton Towers in terms of getting planning consent. You assume that we've got a lot of land here and we can put up anything we want. And nothing could be further from the truth. This is historic landscape, we've got a, a grade two uh, listed building uh, and we cannot do whatever we want. And the planners made it abundantly clear to us that we couldn't build anything that could be seen from outside the park, it couldn't be high, it couldn't be noisy. Um, we were faced with a big problem. We had to think outside the box. Blackpool, we're about to build the big one and let's face it, the big one is about as high as uh, well, you could get at that time in, in, uh, in the country. Uh, we couldn't do that. We had to do something different. Um, so we looked around for a, a new type of, of roller coaster that wouldn't need a tremendous amount of, of height. And we decided on the Arrow Pipeline Coaster. This was something that Arrow Dynamics had... had um, uh, devised, uh, it hadn't, they only built a prototype, and the idea was that instead of uh, riding on top of the track, it, it, it was rather like a bullet that ran, as you can see, uh, between the rails. Um, so that it, it, you, you actually, your heart line was, was within the, the, the rails themselves, and you could then do spirals. Uh, uh, rather like going through the rifle, a rifle bullet going through, through, a, through a gun barrel. Um, and we thought this would be rather exciting. Um, it looked a bit like um, a missile. And I came up with the idea that, that we could create a theme as if this was some kind of secret weapon that was being developed by some sinister organisation within a perimeter fence uh, with keep-out notices uh, no one would ever know exactly whether this was some kind of atomic weapon or whatever. Um, and I got very excited about the, this, this theme of a secret weapon. Um, I went out to, to Utah to ride the prototype. This was the prototype. Um, and I discovered that it was incredibly slow, boring, ponderous, and had, uh, was very energy inefficient. And we would have actually needed a very high lift in order to give the ride uh, any size. And so, uh, to be frank, it was back to the drawing board, but the secret weapon was a name that we'd already latched onto. Uh, and as a consequence, the first layout drawing that I produced for this Arrow Pipeline, um, I la labeled SW1. And for those of you that know, this, this SW prefix has carried on over the years, and all our, our new rides are, are given the code uh, letters of SW. But unfortunately, it, it was back to, to the drawing board. Um, and then I heard uh, that a very enigmatic Swiss engineering company called Bolliger and Mabillard were developing a new kind of coaster um, at, uh, at the Six Flags Park in Chicago. Uh, 
it would have been a prototype layout. Um, and I heard when uh, I saw photographs of the loop being installed that amazingly enough, the track was on the outside of the loop. And I thought, this is amazing. It must be some kind of inverted coaster that, that actually can do loops and corkscrews. Now, we'd done the, the Vampire at Chessington, which was a swing coaster beneath the track, but there was no chance of getting the thing to turn loops and corkscrews, and everyone said it's impossible. But it looked as if B&M were able to do it. So uh, I contacted uh, a colleague of mine six, uh, six Flags, Harold Hudson, who was head of engineering, and I said, Harold, I've heard that you're doing uh, this new kind of coaster, and we're interested. And he was, to start off with, a, a bit cagey because they have decided to keep it very much under wraps. But uh, eventually he agreed that I could talk to B&M about this. So I spoke to B&M and they said that they would be willing, once they'd got the, the prototype at the Six Flags running, to do a custom layout for us. Uh, when I asked them how high the lift would have to be, it was going to be very obvious that the lift was going to, the top of the lift was going to be way above treetop level, way above treetop level, and therefore there was no way we could do it. And then we thought, well, if we can't go up, let's go down. Now, so many people over the years have said to me, oh, it's very clever of you to work out that layout of Nemesis around the hole. And I said, no, th there wasn't a hole there. That was a flat level site. There was no hole up there at all. It was simply a grassy grassy bank uh, and we decided that if we were going to get this ride here at Alton Towers we would have to dig a great big hole and people said you're crazy it's going to cost you a fortune and it did cost us a fortune <laughs> <laughs> but I think you'll agree it was well worth it it was really well worth it nobody had ever done anything as audacious as that before we actually managed to sell some of the rock that we dug out, didn't we? Yeah. Um, so uh, B&M gave me some um, data that enabled me to do a layout for, for the ride. And we moved on from SW1 um, to SW2. And uh, that, if you can see, is the original <coughs> layout of the ride. Now, it's a bit difficult for you to... Uh, to see the layout, but that's it. Now, uh, that drawing number actually says SW2, and it's quite historic, this. There's the station, here's the lift. We, we, the whole layout was designed around a tree, and that tree is still there, I think. I think it's still there. It is, isn't it, Liz? Um, uh, the, the high point of the ride had to be concealed by an existing tree on the site, and the highest tree on the site was up here. So that had to be the top of the lift. And then I worked backwards from that. Now, normally roller coasters have the station at the lowest point of the ride. Now that has a huge disadvantage because I personally believe that roller coasters uh, should um, uh, subscribe to the general law of show business that you leave the best to last. And of course, as you all know, most roller coasters start off fantastic. You've got the big drop, and they get progressively lower and lower to the ground until, just before you come into the station, they're really rather feeble. And I didn't want our new ride, we didn't have a name for it then, I didn't want our new ride to be like that. And so I thought, right, we will not put the station at the bottom of the hole, we'll put the station halfway up the hole which will enable us to do something rather outrageous at the very end of the ride here and have an inversion below the level of the station at the very end of the ride. And I think you'll agree that Nemesis still packs a punch right up to when you come into the station brakes. And that's the reason why this layout was configured as it is. Here is the first uh, inversion around the spiral under the monorail. And of course the monorail was there, so we had to work, work our way around the monorail over the top of the station doing an inline twist, around doing a vertical loop, and then this inversion at the very, very end of the ride through the tunnel. No one had ever tried this before. It was an incredibly complicated feat of civil engineering, 
And there isn't one single foundation of the ride that is on the same level. All the foundations are at different levels. It was incredibly complicated. Um, but uh, the project went extremely well. Um, and it, it uh, opened on time, on budget. Um, but how did the legend itself start? Well, um, this is the most important document. This is a memo from me to the development team, but, but specifically to, 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 to Nick. Um, and as you'll see, it's dated November the 5th, 1992. Uh, subject, secret weapon. And uh, as, as you can see, I don't know whether you can read it, but shall I read it out to you if you can't? It says, we all know that roller coaster hardware we're about to acquire will give us one of the most sensational roller coasters in the world. However, this hardware is available to anyone with sufficient cash, and we're therefore determined to conceive its theme so as to make it the most sensational in the world, and one which cannot be copied. For some time now, we've been agreed that the ride would be themed as some huge <coughs> alien creature. And the reason for that was the track looked quite serpentine. It looked like the tentacles of a monster. But in order for me to pull this together into a cogent form, Nick Varney and I have agreed to arrange a brainstorming session with our various PR, advertising and promotional agents and consultants. This proved to be a most useful exercise, and from this I've placed together the scenario which follows. It must be appreciated that it's not necessarily for the visitor to grasp the storyline. In other words, this was a back story. In fact, what they see must be an enigma to them, and therefore we don't want them to fully understand it. However, in order for us to design the station, the colour of the track and structure, the name of the ride, the music and special effects, etc., in other words, the theming, it is vital for us to understand exactly what is going on. Please don't therefore get hung up about whether the following is too deep for the visitors to grasp. In this instance, that's a good thing. We want the visitors scratching their heads in disbelief. Beneath, now, so this is the story. Beneath the ground at Orton Towers, something horrible exists. This legend has perpetuated over the centuries when massive rumbling noises have been heard and movement has been felt as if some huge alien creature is writhing around underground. Because of this, the area has become a place of pilgrimage and worship, and the high priest is actually sat there. Mark was on that video. <laughs> he was the, the high priest in the video. Um, uh, as li the, the lines of Neolithic standing stones indicate, and we subsequently put those stones up as, as a result. Um, Archaeologists have explored the site for many years in the hope of uncovering its mysteries. Occasionally patches of grass have died where a strange yellow slime has oozed to the surface, rapidly hardening to a solid bone-like material. Some time ago a sample of this slime was sent to the Royal Geological Society for examination. What a load of rubbish all this <laughs> and, and two weeks later a team of investigators from the Ministry of Defence cordoned off the site and declared it a prohibited place. Massive excavations have taken place under a cloak of total secrecy, but from what we can gather, this is the explanation. A massive alien organism has been living in the rock under Orton Towers for eons. It apparently consists of a central host which sends out skeletal tentacles through cracks in the rock, rather like a spreading fungus. Unlike normal creatures whose internal organs are nourished by bringing vital nutrients into their bodies, this creature's organs move out along these solidified tentacles to gather their nutrients and procreate. As the Ministry of Defence started to excavate, they began to uncover sections of these exoskeletal ten tentacles. The more rock they excavated, the more these sections connected together and seemed to all lead back towards some huge living, breathing alien creature. This creature is purely coincidentally of approximately the same size and shape as a bolivar and other <laughs> Perhaps we could take advantage of this case. As the exoskeletal tentacles were uncovered, the creature sensed what was happening and began to cause them to fly around and ride. 
Um, the MODs had to erect massive steel support structures around them to contain them and pin them back down to the excavated bedrock. Every minute or so, the host creature, which still has to be given a name, ejects one of its exploratory organs along its exoskeleton to gather its nutrients from the bedrock which once surrounded it. It has been rumoured that MOD scientists have actually dared to joyride on these exploratory organs as they move around the skeleton, desperately seeking contact with the ground. Only the most fearless of people would be foolhardy enough to do that. Of course, these are just rumours. We'll keep everybody informed as we get to know more. So that's it. That, those two pages got Nemesis kicked off. Uh, and the rest, as they say, is history. Well, we, the whole team was struggling to find a name. We could not think of a suitable name. We invited all the, all the staff to put forward ideas, and we had short lists and so on, and we were getting absolutely nowhere. And the, the deadlines for the promotional material were, were, were looming up, and we still didn't have a name. And I was walking past uh, Nick's office one evening, and he dragged me in. And he said, we're not leaving this office, you and I, until we come up with a name. It doesn't matter how long it takes, you and I are going to come up with a name. And um, we started throwing around ideas, and we weren't getting too far. And then, I don't know whether you spotted it or I spotted it, but on, on, on the bookshelf in his office, we saw the answer, and it was a bottle of Southern Comfort. And we started to, to, to empty this bottle of Southern Comfort, and as our minds got more and more lubricated, we came up with names, and Nick said, I won't try and imitate as an inebriated voice, but I think we were probably both fairly inebriated at the time. He said, I don't care what you call it, but I think we should end in is. That has got a sort of prehistoric kind of sounding name. And... and he thinks I came up with the name. I think he came up with the name Nemesis. We, 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 who came up with it, it doesn't matter. Immediately, we, the name, we knew it was the right one. We knew we had got the right name. Uh, Nemesis. Back when, um, pre-Nemesis days, I took a group of coaster enthusiasts to America. Um, it was back in 1993. We were on a coach and we went to visit 14 amusement parks uh, all across the states, over 100 roller coasters, but one in particular was going to be of interest to us, and it was a ride called Batman the Ride. It was the first ride of its type, which as John has mentioned already, and there was a lot of intrigue in it, and people asked me what it's about, what is an inverted coaster? And, and at the time, of course, there, there, was, there was no internet or things to, to describe or to show pictures and so on, so all I could describe it as was a bit of a demented ski lift with your legs swinging beneath you. And I thought that was a fairly accurate description of it. Um, and the trip went on and we finally got to the Six Flags Park and we went on to that ride. And that day, the members were walked into the park slightly quicker than normal, ran down to there. And the first time they've seen the Nemesis-style trains, this, this normal you climb into the coaster car, of course, this was the first time you had to climb up onto a chair, the legs still swinging about beneath you. And the floor then dropped away, which, was, which nobody knew was going to happen. And then off the train went, up the lift hill. And that moment it dropped off, off the top of the lift hill and did a swoop to the left, your legs swinging. It was all very unique, a very strange feeling. And, and Peter over there was on the tour, remember, remember that first spin. And when we, when we got off, everybody was cheering, everyone was clapping and applauding the ride, which, which um, it, even the Americans found strange. Uh, that's a British stiff upper lip, and here we are showing some emotion that they're not used to seeing from us, but it was very exciting for us. The day went on, we got back onto the bus. Unbeknown to the group, I had an envelope that John had given me prior to the trip. It was sealed up and he told me, and the note it said, do not open this until we have ridden Batman the ride. So slowly I peeled open uh, the envelope, took out the letter, and it was very short, and all it said was, if you enjoyed Batman the ride, be prepared to be amazed at Alton Towers next year when we get a better version. <laughs> <laughs> Much applause and, and uh, cheering on the bus, of course, and lots of speculation about what it was going to be like. How could they better Batman the Ride? Many of you have ridden Batman the Ride type ride. 
Now we don't, you'd walk past them in the parks now because the, the, there's so many other things to do. But back then, that was, that was one of the biggest things we'd ever seen. And so how were, how were Alton Towers going to beat that? How was John and his crazy imagination going to come up with something that could top this Batman ride? Now, of course, we couldn't announce this. It was a world exclusive for us on the bus, but there was an internet. There wasn't mobile phones that you could, that you could suddenly post on Facebook and Twitter. And so we couldn't, we couldn't tell anybody this, this great gossip that we'd got. It was just left down to us. I mean, obviously, nowadays, um, with, with all these internets and Twitter and so on, I mean, if, if, if I had an envelope from John on an America trip that said maybe Orson Towers would get a wooden coaster or something, <laughs> two minutes later, the world would know. So... Get one mentioned. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> lost, me, lost me thread now. So we came back to the UK, and, and excitement was growing. And I came down, or came up to the park, and I live in London, so I came up to the park on many, many occasions um, myself and Paul Burton um, and and Justin Gavanovich from the ECC. We we would travel up here regularly. Um, Paul to take many pictures, which you're seeing behind me. Um, we we were. Met John many times, Walter and um, it wasn't, it wasn't not Claude, Walter was here, Walter, yeah, yeah. To, um, from B&M, um, and we watched that, that whole, was Claude. it was Claude, <laughs> we watched the whole get bigger and bigger, um, of course we still didn't really know what was coming and how they were going to beat, beat this Batman ride, the whole got bigger, track was arriving, we saw the track in the car park, which um, you've probably seen pictures of us climbing over it and so on, all this was building excitement up, we, we were trying to push it as best we could in our, in our magazines to encourage everybody to, to come and try, try this out when it opened. And we watched it start to be created. The track was being put into place as it is there. The um, theming started to appear. Um, I was fortunate I actually got to go to the factory over in Switzerland to see the trains being built. And eventually they got to the point of testing the ride. And uh, I didn't see the first testing, which was the sandbag one, but I stood with John on a, on a daytime uh, session when it, when it went around the track and the two of us we stood on a, on a, it's the bit near the station where, where the steps are, we stood there grinning. John, because his new creation was coming to life, me, because I knew I had something I was going to ride very soon when it opened. Um, and as a, as a young enthusiast then, a little bit older now, but as a young enthusiast then, of course, any new ride, we just want to get on and ride it. And eventually, um, I got to do a test ride on it, and everything I had hoped for was exceeded. And... I had to do this from the promotional video, part of one you've seen, but a pro television program called Coaster Mania. If you remember Coaster Mania, that crazy one of me paint, painting a fence outside the house and things. Um, and I, had to, I was forced to ride Nemesis 14 times in a row. I was forced to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I knew, after, because they wanted to get all the different angles, I knew after that, those 14 rides that because of every time I rode it, I got a feeling of excitement and exhilaration from it. I knew that this was something special. And that letter that I read on the coach that said they're going to be doing it only better, I knew was, was accurate. It, it was far, far better than, than the Batman ride, which is still a good ride, but this is better, and it's in our country, so it's much better. And opening day came, and the cues of people, the excitement at seeing this for the first time and hearing their comments when they got off of it, just... just the, 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 the motion it promoted for people w was fantastic. And then came my first club event here um, of that year. We, we'd done ones before, but top rides then corkscrew, black hole. So, so here we are, a club event. And over 200 members attended. We never had an event here with that many members attending. And we had an exclusive ride session on Nemesis. One hour to ourselves, which is what you're going to experience very soon tonight. And at the end of that hour... Nobody wanted to get off the ride. Someone even suggested having a whip round to pay the staff to stay later. But the staff were quite keen. I think it was the management weren't so happy about that. But, but, but it, it was, um, it, it, it just, promote, we never had that sort of atmosphere on a, on a coaster before, it, and, and one that had lasted an entire session. When I go back to the America trip, the hundred rides we'd done, we had lots of exclusive ride sessions, but after 20 minutes or 30 minutes or so, it, people were dropping out and it was the hardcore left for the hour. On this one, at the end of the hour, I couldn't get people off the ride. And it was to the point where we were going to say, we're going to just have to turn it off and switch the lights out. You're going to have to go home. <laughs> We've done that event now, it's called Loopathon. We've done that event now for the entire history of Nemesis. 
and we usually try and finish on it so it's pitch black as well um, and then we do turn the lights out it's even more fun and it still now 21 years later creates the same level of enthusiasm and excitement as it did when it first opened and I don't know many coasters in the world that can do that it, it's it's just fantastic that it still does that and when I have my event later in this year it's, it will be the same and particularly as it's the 21st birthday because even more reason to, to celebrate it and it's it's just when you hear the background story um, and then how it all came about and the difficulties to get it and, and the height limits that the park has trouble with the planning applications the park has trouble with just to, to say let's just go down then make it extra special, do exactly what John said in the letter to me, and achieving that is remarkable. And after 21 years, I've got, I'm going to read it from here as I put, I think it was then, and still is now, one of the most exciting and intense roller coasters in the world. It might only last just over a minute, but when you've ridden it, that memory lasts a lifetime. And for some people here, it's lasted 21 years. Some of you are not old enough, but, but for those who are, it's lasted 21 years. And it still rides as good today as it did 21 years ago. Not a lot of coasters can say that. So um, I think if you've got a glass there or a cup or anything, we should raise a glass and say, happy birthday, Nemesis. Thank you, John, Nick, and all of Wharton Tower for bringing it to us. Good job.